we want to welcome you all back to another video, another Zoom presentation uh, with the, uh, the folks at the Merriman Financial Education Foundation who are working hard to, uh, to share more about how investing works. And uh, if you weren't here before, let me introduce to my left, I no, that would be my right. Uh, would be Chris, Chris Pedersen, who is our director of research, and uh, below me on this on my screen is Daryl Balls, who is the director of analytics. And uh, these two guys, they do all the heavy lifting on the research that we do, all the tables that that uh, that we produce. And the questions we're going to answer today uh, have come from one of two uh, presentations we made online. One was a Choose FI National uh, Facebook live uh, uh, streaming program that we did. It lasted three and a half hours, including answering questions, but we didn't get to all of them, so it took more. And then another Choose FI presentation in the uh, Seattle area uh, some weeks later. So we have a bunch of those questions we have to respond to that we were not able to get to. So, uh, and, and I'll just comment for those of you who did not see or hear the previous piece that we did, that uh, Margie, uh, who helps us put these together so they get up on the internet, uh, has gone through and selected the times that each question is responded to so that if you want to go right to uh, that spot on the video or that spot on the podcast, you can do that. So uh, with that, I've got a long list of questions for you guys. Uh, I've been told since we went an hour and a half doing this last time that, that I'm not allowed to talk as much as I did before, and I'm already behind. So here we go. Um, first question, give you, a, give you an easy one. During retirement, should you draw from the target date fund or the more risky small cap value fund? And Chris, I know this one is for you because this has to do with the two funds for life that, uh, that you presented uh, that, uh, both of those days for Choose FI. And uh, what do you say to the person who's asking about that decision at the point of when, when you're in retirement? Basically, it's a rebalancing opportunity, right? So in the same way that when you were contributing in your, in your earlier years, you would have contributed to the fund that was underrepresented compared to your desired allocation, uh, you, would, you would do the opposite in in retirement, if you're taking money out, you would take money out of the fund that is overrepresented. So the one that's grown, right? If it's been a good period of time for small cap value and it's grown to be a higher percentage of your portfolio than you're supposed to have at that point in time, uh, this is your opportunity to sell high, right? So I would take out of the target or the, uh, the small cap value. If on the other hand, uh, small in value have been out of favor and the target date fund has held its position or grown to be higher than it's supposed to be in your portfolio, I'd take out of that. So it's basically a rebalancing opportunity and, um, you know, just try to nudge things back towards your desired allocation. Now, if I just add one very quick thing, if they're following the two funds for life strategy and they're multiplying their age, let's say it's 60, uh, then they have very little small cap value at that point. Uh, I think that at age 60, one and a half would be 90 and uh, be 90% in the target date fund and 10% in small cap value. But by the time you're 66, there is no small cap value unless you put some in there yourself. I mean, that, that would be another answer to that question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're down to one fund, then it's pretty easy to know what to take from. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, my wife wants to know, and I think this one's for you here, Daryl, why you don't recommend mid cap funds. 
well. I think that uh, mid cap funds are kind of, well, let's back up a second and talk about why we recommend small. Um, small versus large gets you on the, the two ends of the seesaw, right? And so if, if, if uh, small is performing well, it'll be better returns. If large is performing well, you'll have better returns. Mid cap is kind of in the middle, so it's kind of a middle of the road solution. Um, I don't particularly have any specific allocation to mid caps. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what Paul or Chris does, but I, I, I would, uh, I, I just believe that that working out on the edges, if you're gonna adopt a, a diversification strategy like that, working on the edges uh, may provide you a better better chance to outperform than sticking in the middle, Chris. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this. I'm gonna guess that it, it, it's difficult, but it comes out of a book uh, and, entitled, um, entitled, oh yes, live it up without outliving your money. Uh, I wrote it. You'd think I'd remember the title. But one of my favorite parts of this book are a series of, uh, of, of tables or graphs that show the, imp the returns for 10 different size companies, from the very smallest to the very largest deciles. And what is so fascinating about these tables over many periods of time is how Boy, when small is out of favor compared to large, it's a huge difference. And then in the next period of time, small is great and large is El Stinko. And, and unfortunately, this is what happens quite often. And in that rebalancing, you would, you would understand the advantage of being able to take from the rich and give to the poor because the differences can be absolutely huge and give give you the leverage that you're looking for from working on the edges. So, hey Paul, if if I can just chime in, um, sure. there is a mid cap value fund we recommend. It's part of our best in class ETFs, and it's not because our portfolio design finds that the most you know the most desirable. Um, the but when we combined it with all of the other funds that are in the best in class ETF set, it populated the Morningstar style boxes more closely to the way DFA populates them. And that's partly due to the fact that we couldn't find a, uh, a mute or an ETF that was large value that was as discounted. It wasn't as far over into the value column. Right. Mm -hmm. So people might, look at that and say, well, wait a minute, you just said you don't recommend a, you know, a mid cap fund. And that's, that's, that is by design. That's true. We like to be on the endpoints because it gives you the, um, a better rebalancing opportunity and it's a more diversified portfolio. But in that particular case, when we played it with the rest of the set, it made sense. So, um, so that is an exception and it's a little bit large, you know, as mid caps would go. So it's kind of on the line between mid and large, which let us nudge it in there. Um, but in general, you know, if I could have found a large value fund instead that was, that had the same discount, I would have done that for the reasons we just described. Yeah. That's great. Okay. How do I invest RMDs required minimum distributions? if I don't need the money to live on. Uh, I, I always thought this was a fun one when I was working with clients because it's nice to know they don't need it. But uh, yeah, Daryl, you might have actually run into this in your own portfolio if I'm, uh, if well, I guess right. Yeah, if, if, you, if you have to take an RMD and you don't need the RMD or don't need all of the RMD to fund your living expenses, I just invest the, re the remainder, whatever's left over or I don't need, into your taxable portfolio. Um, and, I would, and I would put it in the asset classes that are underweight in that taxable portfolio. Use it as a balance either use it as an opportunity to rebalance or to uh, back towards your desired asset allocation. I think it's, to a certain extent, I think it's that simple. So I'm, I'm curious, in your 
particular situation uh, with that money that is taxable? Is it mostly in equities? Because that would be the more tax efficient place to have them. Um, that's where we have two different taxable accounts right now, and both of them are 100% equity. Our fixed income assets are held in an IRA. So, um, and, and yeah, would you do the same thing in terms of what you would house in the taxable part? Uh, would you put your equities in the taxable portion? That's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if Chris did the same. Oh, Chris. I, I don't know if Chris heard me or not. Oh, uh, think... yeah. I, I, you cut out briefly, but, um, oh. uh, you know, we, just by accident, we ended up uh, tax diversified in our retirement savings so that we have, and it ended, it ended up being a really helpful thing. Uh, we have some of our retirement savings in taxable accounts and some of it in tax deferred accounts. And that was useful when I ended up retiring earlier than I expected because there were no penalties for withdrawing from the taxable accounts um, where if I had, now, if I'd had a big Roth account, that would have been fine too. I but I didn't, unfortunately. So, um, so we actually we have we have equities in both the tax deferred and the taxable accounts. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the best strategy for investing for my four children, ages seventeen, five, five, and three? I have their investments in. Uniform Trust to Minor Act accounts. Uh, either one of you want to take that one? I'll let Chris do that. Okay. You have young people that are uh, not not five and five, but uh, what's your what's your youngest? Yeah. I have grandchildren. I have grandchildren that are right, right, of course, down in those ages, and we've encouraged the the parents to invest in. Um, you know, have a, a, with a heavy tilt towards small in value. Uh, now they, they have to be comfortable with it, right? But we've encouraged them to uh, invest the kids' money as if it was going to be there in the same investment for a very long period of time. And it could be, it could patiently wait out times when that asset class does poorly in hopes of getting a premium return. And with an expectation that the worst case is probably that they suffer more volatility along the way for a return that's not that different from, from the, uh, the broader stock market. So yeah, we've encouraged them to uh, take those very long funds and invest them in small cap value. And, and we've at least talked about the possibility of diversifying that with you know, some in US, some international, and some in emerging markets. So rather than having it all in the U.S. small cap value, they could build a small aggressive portfolio for the long term that's a combination of those three. Yep. And, and of course, if this uh, money is going to end up being for education, then that would be a whole different decision making process. And uh, so yeah, because that's that's like a 20 year horizon instead of a 50 year or 60 year horizon. Yeah. Right. So you so, might want more confidence in short-term returns. Yep. Is W, I'm sorry, is VWEAX, which by the way is the Vanguard High Yield uh, Admiral uh, shares, uh, is it still a good retirement fund choice? I'll take this one if you guys don't mind. Uh, and the reason is because we do have that fund in our what we call our monthly income portfolio at, at Vanguard. Uh, and that portfolio is a combination of some uh, uh, high yield, 25%, 25% in a Ginny May, 25% intermediate corporate, 25% uh, uh, short-term uh, corporate. Uh, that combination right now pays about a, on average 3% and uh, certainly a much higher return than, than, than you would uh, get with government-based uh, bond funds. Uh, the high-yield bond fund at Vanguard, I, I've been a fan of because it's the highest quality bond fund that I know of. It hasn't had the kind of 
downside risk in the worst of times. 2008, it was down about 20%, but there were lots of bond funds that were down 30 and 40%. I'm talking high yield junk bond funds. Uh, and then when the market turned around the next year and got well, I think it was up about 30 or 35%. It was a big move. But um, uh, so it's, it's going to obviously be a more risky, more volatile because high yield bonds kind of look like stocks during the bad times. And uh, so you would expect the volatility, but you'd also expect to get a higher rate of return. Right now, I believe it's paying about 5.6%. Uh, which is a good return on 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 bonds. Anybody want to add anything to that? Well, I, I think it's seen uh, it's seen some volatility this year as well, right? It's already it's, it's down. Dead. It's I think it's down about three percent. Uh, yeah, but it it had a bigger dip and has come back, right? Exactly. Yeah. I yeah. think it was off fifteen fifteen to twenty percent, something like that. But um, but like like before you said it, it snapped back. And so, you know, that short-term risk may be worth the yield. Yeah. And you're, and the yield is what you're after. If you're looking for income, if you're looking right. for stability, not the best place to find stability. Here's one. Uh, the media reports the stock market remains overvalued in spite of the recent crash. For what reasons would I want to buy now if the market is expected to drop even more? This, of course, is the biggest test of all, I think, for investors who think about investing and uh, try to make sense of it. Any, any advice, Daryl, to people who are trying to time the market? Well, I, I don't time, try to time the market. Um, I just I find an asset allocation that works for me and I pretty much stick with it and, and let it ride, it ride it out. I look at it every once in a while to see if I've broken any of my rebalancing bands but, uh, because that's the approach I use to rebalance. Um, but I, don't, I tried to tune out the noise um, from, the, from the media with respect to market, what you should or shouldn't do in the market and why the market does whatever it does. Um, I think Paul had a, Paul used to have an interesting uh, article, I think it was, or talk about how there are 10 reasons why you should sell now and 10 reasons why you should buy now. So, you know, you can find it, you can find whichever side you happen to think you want to be on and find confirmation of that particular point of view. So, so when you sure were or anybody an, knows. When you were an accumulator, you just... Every month, putting money in, and now you're taking distributions, you're in retirement. Has the timing, have you had to change the timing of things in any way? Uh, no, I'm not quite sure I understand what you, you mean just by take, timing. You take a certain amount of money at a certain time, regardless of whether the market's up or down. It's just the opposite of being an automatic investor but now you're taking it out instead of putting it in? Well, actually, when the way we actually do it is we, we take it when we need it. We, uh, we sort of, the way we manage it is we have, we have our checking account, if you will. Um, we pay our daily expenses from, our living expenses from, and, and as, it, as it goes down and breaks below a threshold where we feel comfortable, we'll take some out of our investments, whichever, wherever it happens to be needed to be taken from and, uh, and refill the, the checking account. And is that an actual checking account or is it a, yeah, well, it, it turns out it is. Yeah. But, but it's the one that we use, uh, we use to, uh, pay all our, our bills. We don't use too many real checks anymore, but, yeah. um, yeah, it's a checking account. Anything to add there, Chris? No, nope, I think you covered it well. Okay. Oh well, actually, I do have one thing to add, and that's that. Um, I know, I, I know that the research says the less you look at your accounts, the better you'll do as an investor. Um, I don't do as good a job of not looking as I would like, but when the market is full of fear, I look less. <laughs> so, 
Uh, I honestly couldn't tell you how much our accounts were off during the worst part of the year because I knew that our investing policy statement says we're not going to panic sell. I wasn't going to do anything about it and it wasn't going to bring me any comfort to look. So when, when the markets were most fearful early in the year, I, I probably went weeks, if not a, you know, a month plus, where I never even looked at our accounts. And, and that's part of how I manage the discipline of being a buy and hold investor. Is I just try to, I try to ignore the fear part and, uh, and, and look away, much like Daryl said, you know, ig ignore the noise. I, I know I can't time the market. I can't get in at just the right time and get out at just the right term, time. So why even think about it? And I, and I think the, it ties into the rebalancing process too. Uh, in fact, in some ways, rebalancing is more difficult because it, 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 it means you're going to take something that's been making you feel good and you're going to put it in something that's been making other people, maybe even you, feel bad. And, uh, and that's what rebalancing is about. And so it's a, Again, another one of those emotional challenges that keep people from being the best they might be. So, yep. okay. Is there, and I think this question has to do with the four fund strategy, is there a reason REITs would not be part of the strategy? Real estate is an app class to help add diversification. So, it's an interesting decision. Uh, Daryl, you want to talk about the pros and cons of adding REITs to the four fund strategy? Um, you know, I haven't really thought about adding REITs to the four fund a lot. Um, I sort of like the simplicity of, of the four funds. I understand the diversification point of view. Um, you can, but I, I, I like the simplicity of it the way it is now. Um, if you start adding REITs for diversification, then you have to ask yourself, well, why don't you add international and why don't you add emerging markets? And um, I think, I think I like the, the four funds seems to be, to me, it's, it's kind of a, a qualitative thing, not quantitative, but it seems to be something that I think the average investor can manage fairly well. Um, it's not a logical argument. It's not well, backed well, up Darryl, by science. Isn't, isn't, but isn't, isn't there a pragmatic argument too? Isn't part of the reason that the four fund solution is the funds that it is just the available history we have? Well, that's how it started out. We went back, yeah. we were able to go back 92 years with, with the uh, U.S., four U.S. asset classes. And we can't do that with, this is, I don't think we can do that. I started to say that if you look at the ultimate buy and hold strategy at the returns, that when you add REITs on top of the other four asset classes that are in the four fund strategy, the difference mm -hmm. in return is very, very small. And, and so I, my sense is that it, it, may be some good diversification, but not likely. Because remember, the minute you put those REITs in there, you take out of the small cap value, you take out of the large cap value, and that may actually set you uh, behind a bit. Okay, uh, when do you think you'll be updating the best in class ETFs uh, for the ultimate buy and hold? And Chris, obviously this is yours. I know you've answered it before, but we get this so often. I guess, I guess when you answer this, will you tell people why you're not doing it every year or every month or whatever short period they would like to see us do? So uh, the short answer is 2021, uh, early 2021, if not late 2020, uh, we will do an update. Uh, the longer answer is, if I saw some information that said it needed to be updated sooner, I would. Um, but uh, I don't want to do it too often because I don't want people to be trading uh, unnecessarily. I don't, I don't want people 
to be taking short-term gains just to switch funds. And when you look at how these funds have done, you know, if you look at the old best-in-class versus the current best-in-class, the differences are very small. You know, it's, it's not a, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, tenths of a percent kind of change because we're not changing asset classes fundamentally. We're just changing the fund choices. Um, our goal is to get you that extra tenth of a percent, right? To get you that extra two tenths of a percent. That's why we put so much work into it. Mm -hmm. But if you were sitting on some cash and saying, you know, gee, I'm, I'm waiting for the 2020 best in class ETFs to come out before I invest, I'd say you're making a mistake. You, you should invest in the best answer you have today. And um, then, you know, we'll, we'll make it better when we can. It, another reason, the final reason I'll give for waiting is that the analysis really hinges, at least in part, on the historical uh, performance of the funds. Do they, do they do what they say they're going to do? And the only way for me to know that for sure is to run a regression, and I need a lot of history to do that. Because I want to look and see, you know, when small was doing well, did the fund that says it's small do well, right? When value was doing well, did the fund that says it's value do well? Um, and that's how I can figure out whether or not they're, they're second guessing the asset class and doing weird things under the hood, or are they actually being true to their mandate? And so it, it takes time for that information to accumulate. I think by the end of this year, we'll have enough information to do a good analysis and also to take a look at the new uh, Avantis funds, which right. there's a lot of interest in those, but they, you know, they haven't been around a year. So uh, I don't have much history on them, but we'll give them a fair we'll give them a fair evaluation and consideration, and they'll be part of our uh, our decision process for the next go round. Great. Um, is the four fund strategy appropriate for a sixty year old investor, Daryl? What do you think? Yeah, I'd say sure. Um, if, it, if it's a strategy that, that uh, you find intriguing or something you, you understand and, and you think you can stick with, I'd say, sure, go ahead. The one thing I would remember is that, that the four fund strategy is, a, is for the equity part of your portfolio. Mm -hmm. You still need to have a, a fixed income uh, part of your portfolio to provide your, your downside risk, if you will. Um, uh, part of your, your portfolio, the, the, your asset allocation. So if you have a 50-50, 50% stocks, 50% fixed income, the 50% that's stocks would be allocated across the four, uh, four funds equally. So you'd have 12.5% in each of the four equity classes, equity asset classes in the four fund portfolio. And, uh, and then that's what you would uh, manage your rebalancing to. So when you're getting to be 60 or 70 uh, and you start to be thinking that, that you're not as long term an investor as you once were, and a lot of people will look at our tables and they'll say, I don't have 50 years to live or I don't have 40 years to live. We know as we look backwards over the last 90 years, that the four fund strategy was in essence less risky one decade at a time uh, in, in terms of, of the, the, the return. The S&P fell out of bed several times when, when the four fund strategy did fine. So if we conclude that over a 10 year period that the four fund strategy was likely to make more money than the S&P 500, as an example, and in a sense be less volatile when we look at the 10-year return, would the de decision we'd have to make be, this part of my investment is for the long term, as opposed to this is my money that I'm using to get my, 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 my income today. Would you, would you differentiate if you were going to decide to add the four funds to whether it was part of the portfolio that was longer term versus part of the portfolio that was shorter term? Would that make any difference? 
I think it depends on how you think about your portfolio. Um, if you manage your portfolio and you treat your portfolio on a total return basis, I don't think it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. If you tend to think of it in terms of buckets, it helps you with your mental accounting of how you, how you see your portfolio, then sure. If you, if you, you could think about it in, in some respects, it's a little bit like uh, Bill Bernstein's liability managed portfolio where you have fixed fixed income assets, let's say, or safer assets that you use to provide your day-to-day -day expenses. And then you have a risk portfolio yeah. where, where you can, you don't need it to live on to provide your day-to-day -day living expenses. So you can do more risky things if you want to think of it that way with that. That's we great. use it. We use a total return perspective. So if I, if I were to choose to do that, that's what I would do. If yeah. I wanted to use a, a, bucket or uh, type of a strategy and not, not the way Christine Benz talks about buckets, but if I wanted to bucket it in terms of safe versus risky, then I would take the risk part of that portfolio and use it that way. And Chris, would you add anything to that? Uh, just the, you know, I agree with Daryl that the, you need to, figure out whether what your ratio of equity to bonds is. And there's two, in my mind, there's two ways to do it. One way is what can you sleep with at night in terms of the drawdown you're willing to tolerate. And that's where the fine tuning tables do a great job of setting expectations. And then the other way is the, the bucket strategy along the lines of what Daryl mentioned with Christine Benz's perspective of, you know, what do you, what do you need for your next, five to seven years, uh, that money should be invested more safely than the money you need beyond that, right? And so for people who've oversaved by a lot, sometimes that, that's a useful alternative perspective in terms of thinking about how they might decide how much to have in fixed income or equity. Um, but you know, both approaches are valid. And, uh, and they'll have different appeals to different people, right? There's people who've oversaved a lot who really could not sleep with the idea of their balance declining by more than 25%. For them, the bucket strategy is not appropriate. For them, the fine tuning tables are perfect, right? So you've got to figure out how you're motivated, what makes you tick, and which of those two approaches is going to let you sleep at night. Great. Thank you. If uh, target funds are funds of funds, does that mean they have two sets of fees. And Chris, I think uh, you had done a little work on this to see what the story is. We did a little, we did a little pre-work and you guys helped out. So let's see if I can share this and we'll try and make it so the people who are on the podcast don't miss out. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Yep. All right, cool. So what I did is I went out and I looked at one of the target date funds at Vanguard, the Vanguard uh, 2030 target retirement fund. And it has a mutual fund expense ratio of 0.14%. Uh, if you read on their website, they'll tell you that that is uh, better than 60 to 80% of the funds out there, right? That they're among the leaders in terms of being the lowest cost. And then if you look farther down the page, it'll tell you that it's made up, that fund is actually made up of one, two, three, four funds. It's made up of the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, the Vanguard Total International Stock Index, the Vanguard Total Bond Market, and the Vanguard Total International Bond Index. And there are varying percentages. It's 41% in the Total Stock Market Index, 27% in the Total International Stock, 22% in the total bond market and 9.6% in the total international bond market. So if we go and we look at the expense ratios of each of those mutual funds and then do a weighted sum of the, uh, that, that's over here, this column is, it's basically the percentage times, or, or the percentage of the fund times the expense ratio uh, that gives you this total over here that I add up and you add all of those up. What you find out is that the weighted investor mutual fund expenses, those are the funds they say they use, 
is practically the same. It's 0.136%, which rounded to the two decimals they use for the fund is 0.14%. So at that point, it looks like this fund of funds is the same price as the underlying funds. And, you know, I stopped there last night and said, we're done, you know, that's it. And then I woke up this morning and I thought, wait a minute, what about ETFs? What about Admiral shares? Could you do this cheaper? And um, the answer is yes. So I went and I collected the ETF share weighted at um, average expenses. And that comes out to, instead of 0.14%, it's 0.05%, 0.0496, but round it to 0.05%. So 0.05% versus 0.14%, it's, you know, 0.9% difference. It's almost 10 basis points. Um, and if you do the same thing for the Admiral shares, it's 0.068%. So, so it looks like, and people had asked this question before, it looks like you could do a DIY version of the Vanguard uh, eat, uh, the Vanguard Target Retirement Fund for less money with ETFs or Admiral shares. But keep in mind, now you're going to have to do the rebalancing. You're going to have to do the purchases. Um, if you're working with uh, the, uh, the ETFs, unless you're at some place that supports fractional shares, you're going to have to deal with the individual share purchases. Um, so you know, it's kind of up to you whether it would be worth the difference, but um, but there is a difference, and I was surprised to see that. All right, and I see here the next question is is one that uh, uh, I think you're going to take on because uh, you did a little research, and that is when you say Vanguard is investor owned, what does that mean? Yeah, I, if you uh, if you go and Google Vanguard mutualized, or you know what does it mean that Vanguard is a mutualized fund, you'll find a pretty simple answer, but it's very telling. Um, and if you compare it to other companies in the space, you'll quickly find an, an important difference, right? So Vanguard is literally owned by the people that own their shares, right? So the shareholders in the company Vanguard are the people that own Vanguard target retirement shares or Vanguard mutual fund shares or Vanguard ETF shares. Those are the owners of the company. Where if you went to Invesco, um, for example, you know, they're owned by shareholders. That company has shareholders looking over their shoulder expecting a profit, right? So you can imagine that the management of these two different companies have very different conversations. In the case of a privately owned uh, or public company that is in the business of creating these shares, they have to deliver a profit, right? So they're trying to figure out how to serve their customers, but they're weighing that against the need to also deliver a profit to their shareholders. Vanguard, in contrast, doesn't have this third party. They don't have another group of people they have to pay. So, so their entire motivation is to give their, their shareholders and customers, which are one in the same, the best return possible. There's no conflict of interest. There's no third party. And that's, that's a, uh, it, it, you know, it's part of the genius of Jack Bogle that he yep. figured out that was the right way to create an investing company. And we should all be very grateful to, to him for having set that up because it has driven competition in the space that we never would have seen, right? It's made all of the public companies have to behave a little bit better and deliver a higher value for the same price to compete. Um, so uh, Vanguard's mutualized structure is wonderful, yeah. And it shows up, according to reports, in his final estate because uh, he was supposedly worth 80 to $90 million. If you look at the competition who worked for a profit for themselves, that might be the Fidelity family, the Johnson family. Mm -hmm. And they're worth billions and billions of dollars. And, uh, and which meant basically that money uh, ended up in the pockets of the Vanguard shareholders instead of the of people like John Bogle. So uh, 
by, by the way, he did not struggle. Eighty million dollars uh, to ninety million dollars is pretty pretty sizable size of state. So, uh, but but it certainly helps shareholders. Okay. Um, here's one. Is the comeback portfolio the same as the four fund combo? I'll do this one. It's so easy. Yes, it is the same. And the reason it got tagged with the title, the comeback portfolio is because I was looking at putting together an article that talked about how do you invest to take advantage of what happens after a typical bear market. And it turns out that value historically has had a huge run from the bottom of the market. All value is a hard thing for people to do. But if you did the simple comeback or for fun portfolio, you can see that at least historically, it had a very strong recovery uh, after uh, a, a big bear market. Now, Daryl, you I saw that look of surprise. Uh, did you yeah, have I've never another heard of the comeback portfolio? Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> so I'm glad you uh, took this one. Oh, <laughs> uh, anyway, that's the comeback portfolio. Uh, and we will see how it comes back as this market right. recovers. Um, could you use a target date fund plus four fund combo uh, as a, a strategy? How would that strategy likely perform compared, let's say, to the two fund portfolio, that, that two funds for life, where you're using the small cap value? What would the expectation be uh, approximately in terms of the difference in, in return? Anybody want to hammer on that one? I, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, the difference is going to be less tilt towards small, less tilt towards value, right? So uh, that means you're going to have less of an expected premium, but you're still going to get the market risk factor, you're going to have more, you know, you're going to get more tilt towards equity. Uh, so the, you know, the fact like for an earlier uh, investor in a target date fund, if they're in their young years and they're trying to offset that 10% fixed income burden that tends to be in the target date fund, anything you add in equities is going to help offset the fixed income uh, with a little bit of added risk and added expected return. So, you know, how much of a difference is it going to make instead of being all small cap value, uh, you're now only 25% small cap value, you're 50% value. Um, so it might reduce those premiums by uh, a half to, you know, a little bit more. So you're going to give up a percent or two during those years. So, you know, it, Without running the numbers, I can't give a precise answer, but even if I gave you a precise answer after running the numbers, I'd have to caveat it by saying, you know, they're not guaranteed and there's a wide range. So I, I'd say it's on the order of a percent or two, probably. I don't know, Gerald, do you have, do you have an instinct or a feel for that that would well, be better? Yeah. When I looked at this, I thought, well, okay, so you're going from a one fund portfolio to a four or five fund portfolio. So you've made your, your life a little more complex to manage it and follow the glide path. But on the other hand, um, one of the things that I, if I was thinking about doing this, adding the four fund to a target date fund, I think I would not include the US large clap blend part of the four fund because it's already in the target date fund. A, a pretty good chunk of the allocation is to the total US stock market in most Darryl, target date Darryl, funds. And I so I would, I would change it to, I would just include the large cap value, small cap blend and small cap value and split that allocation one third, one third, one third. Because oh. the large cap blend is in the target date. Got it. it um, we, did, we did model in the article, uh, if you go back and look at uh, some of the presentations and articles we've done, we've modeled, modeled for example, doing all value, um, you know, doing mm -hmm. the two, the large value and the small value. So uh, you can probably get a feel for, and we also modeled, I think in the uh, Choose FI slide deck uh, doing S&P 500. So if you go and look at the article and the slides that we did for Choose FI, and you can probably start to triangulate and figure out, you know, where the numbers say it would land. 
um, again, no guarantees the future will be like the past, but you know, it helps set expectations. Uh, here's an easy one. Uh, is the target date fund based on retirement age or your life expectancy? I thought that was an interesting way to think about a target date fund. But uh, there may be people who don't know how those target date funds work. Chris, you, you're you the target the, date the number fund. On the target, yeah, the number on the target date fund is supposed to correlate with the year in which you retire. Part of the reason there may be a question here is that when you go to Vanguard on the page where they have the target retirement funds, they they give you a choice either to use age or the year in which you would retire. And the age, the age links sometimes take you to something other than a target retirement fund. Uh, because, you know, if, if you were born in the 1940s and you're on their target retirement fund page, they may feel like they have a better solution for you. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, the target retirement fund date, if it says target retirement 2040, that's the year in which you're supposed to retire. That, that, that's the, the theory. Some people game it. Some people, um, I, I have a friend who does something I find fascinating. He wants maximum diversification and, so, and he doesn't know when he's gonna retire. So he buys a whole bunch of different target retirement funds in his, <laughs> uh, in his retirement account, right? Which is, he thinks it's giving him diversification and it's hedging his back because he doesn't know the year in which he's gonna retire. The truth is, you average those things together and he's getting the retirement fund that's in the middle, right? It really isn't, it's, it's just complexity, but, um, but people do that. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. The other thing is that, that if you, if you buy a target retirement or target date fund, most of them, and you base it on your retirement age, most of them, when they get to that point or shortly thereafter, they sort of level out on a, on a, not some sort of a nominal asset allocation kind of maintain it afterwards. So uh, that's, that ends up being the life expectancy part of that. They, yes, they, right. they manage it at a, at a reasonably constant, most of them reasonably constant asset allocation after your retirement date. So you can sort of play those games, you know, if you want to, if you want to not reach a constant allocation until age 70, then pretend you're retired at 70 rather than 60 and, and pick your target date fund that way. So you can game it that way also, as Chris says. And, and it makes a difference what target date fund you use at yeah. uh, BlackRock. At my age, I believe it's 40% equity. At Vanguard, it's 30% equity. And, and I'm 50% equity. So there are a lot of legitimate choices. Um, given that small caps may struggle for the foreseeable future due to the recent pandemic, digging deep to explain all these things here, should one focus more on large caps or is this the time to rebalance more heavily towards small caps as it is selling at a larger discount. So this begs a question, one of market timing, but two, when do you rebalance? So uh, I suspect you both have slightly different answers. Chris, what would you do in terms of the, the rebalance decision? Uh, I'm very hesitant to ever think I know anything about the future. Uh, so I, I really like the idea of uh, hedging my bet by spreading it out. So I like dollar cost averaging and I like uh, sticking to my policy statement, which is a, an allocation, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, anytime I catch myself thinking, oh, now is the time to do X, Y, Z, I, I remember a few different things. And one of them is that you don't have to, you know, a, how confident are you in that decision? And it's usually pretty low, you know, and, and B, how much of it, how much of that decision do I have to make today? Right. And the answer is none, but um, I could do a little bit. Right. So uh, if I, if I ever catch myself thinking about a market timing like that, uh, I usually look and see if it's consistent with my rebalancing needs. Right. 
So let's say uh, small cap value has been hammered. Well, odds are that small cap value or, or small in this case, you know, I think that's the question is small, is going to be a smaller part of my portfolio, right? Because it's, prob it's probably down. Um, and so from a strict rebalancing standpoint, it's going to make sense to sell something that's more appreciated and move it into that asset class. So that's fine. Um, now, is today the day to do it? Well, if I find my, that's a market timing question, right? So rather than doing it all today, I might just say, well, it looks like I got to move, you know, let's say it's 5% to rebalance this. That would be big, but let's say it's 5%. Well, I could, I could move a percent today and then I could move a percent next week. And then I could look and see if it still makes sense and move a percent the following week. And that gives me the ability to avoid the regret of having done it at a, you know the wrong time, right? Because one of those times is gonna be good, one of those times is gonna be bad, a couple of them are gonna be in the middle, and at the end of the day, I'm gonna say I was prudent, right? And that's, that's really what I want for my personal finances. I wanna be prudent. And so um, spreading it out, making it consistent with my investing policy statement and trying to rebalance. That's what, that's what I would do. And all of those things really don't have to do with the status of the market at the moment. I, I mean, they, they kind of do because the rebalance is going to depend on where things are, but I'm not making a crystal ball judgment about is today the day, you know, is today the day when I should really move everything into uh, this other asset class. So that's, that's how I do it. I keep the moves small and try and keep it consistent with my investing policy statement. How about you, Daryl? Um, I, I rebalance based on rebalancing bands. I don't look at which, I don't look at what, I don't look at any financial media uh, to help me make a decision. Um, I do, I do look at my portfolio every week, um, but live through several bear and, and uh, survive them all. Um, it doesn't bother me anymore uh, to watch it go up and down like that. And so I look at it every week. Um, if it looks like it's, it's moved quite a bit, I'll go to a hab where I can go check and see what the asset allocation is and whether I need to rebalance. And if so, how I do that. Um, but I use rebalancing bands, not, not time-based rebalancing. So, so I do need to check it every once in a while, but you'd be surprised how far the market has to move to break a 5% rebalancing band when your asset allocation is 50, 50, it's a long ways. And, and so uh, I hardly ever have to end up doing that. But if I did, I would look at which asset classes are underrepresented and move money into those. If it's small cap, it's small cap. Terrific. So those are the two very different answers. My answer is, Somebody does it for me. That's about as automated as I know how, but they work with bands. And they may be very similar to the bands that you personally have chosen, Daryl. But, but uh, I, I don't want to be any part of that process, but I do want it to be done mechanically. And I would struggle. If I were doing it, I would do it probably once a year. And because it, it does take a lot. For to things to get 50 50 as we are too it does take a lot to get that out of balance but i would have used once a year to get the emotion out of it but i i notice particularly with tax loss harvesting and whatnot that an advisor will move in and take advantage of of those uh, opportunities but i probably personally uh, would not Oh, um, if any of these scenarios in retirement, are you withdrawing cash to cover all? This is referring to where we talked about taking money out of the portfolio. Are you withdrawing cash to cover two to three years or expenses or simply drawing cash for the current year? In other words, when you take cash out, are you taking it for just the current year or are you looking at a longer period of time so you don't have to be concerned about having access to cash while the market is in decline? I assume it's what that question is about. So uh, Daryl, why don't you pick up 
on. Well, so so there's there are several different ways to look at this, right? There, there's what do I do or what do we do, my wife and I. And I already talked about that earlier, where we just take it when we need it on a total return basis. Um, the other thing is, what, what, what are the distribution tables that we publish show? What are they based on? And I can tell you that those are based on yearly distributions at the first of the year uh, to sort of go through and, and, and provide a framework for how we build those distribution tables. Uh, I forgot what the other question was, Paul. What was the other part of that? Well, it's a, basically the question, do you just take care of a year? Do you take care of multiple years? And, and uh, so. Well, the, the distribution tables are depending on the methodology set up behind them. They take that, that whole annual amount once a year at the beginning of the year. Um, in my own personal portfolio, um, I'm not quite as rigorous because, because I don't take a distribution until our, our uh, account that we pay our expenses out of reaches some minimum lower level below which we would start to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I refill it up to a level where I won't feel uncomfortable probably for another six months to a year probably. Um, so that's, yeah. Chris, it's, but it's a ballpark estimate because you really don't know what your expense, I mean, you we don't anyway really know exactly how much our expenses are going to be over the next six months for example i you know i think the phrase you said in there is that stuck with me is what you'll be comfortable with uh, when when we have the conversation uh here in the you know with my wife and i and we're trying to figure it out um that drives the amount i i know intellectually that the longer I leave it in the market, on average, the higher return I'm going to have, right? So the less cash burden we can live with, the better we'll do. But I also know that uh, it it makes us collectively nervous if we don't know where that next, uh, you know, it, it, we couldn't live month to month. It, it would it would uh, make us crazy. Uh, having to sell something every month or having to you know count on the dividends covering the expenses every month. Um, so you have to figure out what's going to work for you. I think Paul, you, you do once a year, we, we kind of run at about a year buffer probably, but it's not set at a regular time. It's kind of, um, on an as needed basis. Uh, you know, when we start to feel like, yeah, we've got a lot of expenses coming in and, you know, we should, we should, uh, boost the buffer, build it up a little bit more. So we're kind of, we're kind of between the two. Daryl, you said it was as needed, and Paul, you're once a year. We're kind of between the two. When I was an advisor, uh, it was not unusual to have people who were very conservative, and what we would decide to do is to have one year of cash, money market, and another year of short-term bond fund. And uh, that when they got down to where the cash was all gone, then they would replenish it, the cash for a year. That short-term bond fund was there for the emergency that, that they might run into a really bad market and not want to dip into the equities in the portfolio that they had. So that was just another way of, it's like, it's like the people, People who take out 3% a year when they could afford to take out 4% a year or even 5% a year. But what they do to be conservative is just take out threes. Now, I think we all do these kinds of mental accounting things to make us comfortable with, uh, with what we have and what we have to worry about. Well, that's uh, one of the key things is when you're in retirement, I think you have to, you have to be able to, to be a little bit flexible about what you're doing. You have to look at what your needs are, what the, what the situation is and, and where, where your portfolio is when you're trying to figure out how much to take from where. Flexibility is a, is a virtue. Here's a last question of the day. I something on your mind. I'm intrigued by your four fund portfolio. However, my respectful criticism of that portfolio is that it does not have any international exposure. 
there is a contributor on the Vogelheads forum who has supposedly done a series of back testing and shown mm -hmm. that the following combo has an identical long-term return to the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And he, what they do is they find a U.S. large cap blend, U.S. small cap value, uh, internet value, and international small cap blend. Uh, so they, they are half international and half U.S. and they are half blend and half uh, uh, value. Mm -hmm. uh, we are. So I think, Chris, you dug into this, or Daryl, did you? Who dug into this? I, we've both we've both dug into it. Um, I'm going to restate because uh, you were cutting in and out the portfolio allocation just so that everybody can hear it. So the and I think Trev H was the contributor on Bogleheads, yes. uh, yes. and it's a great it's a great portfolio. It's a 25% mm -hmm. U.S. large cap blend. 25% uh, U.S. small cap value, 25% international large cap value, and 25% international small cap value. So if you think small of the cap four blend. small cap, or I'm blend. sorry, small cap blend. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. So if you think about a Morningstar style box, you know where you got small in value, uh, uh, you know, going on the different dimensions. It's four corners. But the diagonals are uh, U.S. in one direction and international in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And our back test, I would, I would hesitate to agree with the statement that it does exactly the same as the ultimate buy and hold. But I would say that the ultimate buy and hold, the four fund solution, and the Trev H portfolio are all pretty close when you, when you look at the back test results. And it almost comes down to, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure we have enough history to tell you how different they would be because they're close enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then second of all, the real difference is in how diversified they are. And some of that's going to be an emotional thing for an individual, an individual investor, right? The Trev H portfolio is half international. So, you know, are you comfortable mm -hmm. being half international? The academics say you should be, right? But, but are you? right? Uh, you have to kind of figure that out for yourself. Uh, the four fund is all U.S., which is not as diversified. It's got a higher concentrated risk in the U.S. economy. And the ultimate buy and hold is uh, both diversified, you know, it's diversified in even more ways, right? It's got a little bit of emerging markets and REITs. And uh, so, so it's, I, I have nothing against the Trev H portfolio. I think it's really good. We have not struggled right. to test it because uh, we have missing asset classes going back to 1970. But Daryl and I are working on that. And Daryl, maybe you want to talk a little bit about what we could do there. I think we would like to do an apples to apples test and be able to come back with some numbers, right? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's possible. We can do a, a, a test using the same methodology that we use for the ultimate buy and hold, we can go back and look at the, the four fund combo and the Trev H portfolio yeah. uh, and compare them that way using the same, the same uh, methodology, the same algorithms, the same funds that we use in, in all the different ones. And we can compare them and, and see how that turns out. That would be a really interesting comparison. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of, of I think of, of which, how much diversification of which kind of which types you want. Um, the ultimate buy and hold is, is uh, U.S. international, and within each one of those, it's large and small, and within each one of those, it's blend and value, okay? Well, Trev H. takes the same major asset classes, but he splits them, like, like Chris mentioned, along the diagonal, and then the four fund is basically it is just U.S. asset classes. So it, a lot of it has to do with what your internal um, internal uh, decisions or biases are in terms of how you how much diversification of which kind you want uh, and, and take a look at it. But uh, it, it's something we can do to look back the last 50 years and take a look at it and see how they would perform. It'll be an interesting test. I look forward to doing that here in the next little bit <laughs> just to, to see how it turns out. Um, 
Well, I, I appreciate all your time as, as always. Uh, you guys have done a marvelous job helping our, helping our readers and listeners uh, uh, do better, I hope, or invest with more confidence. That's uh, part of the process that I think helps make you a successful investor. Uh, I hope that if you uh, get a chance to go to uh, YouTube uh, when we get this uh, up, that you will uh, suggest some of your uh, friends take a take a look uh, and leave comments at the at the, after the presentation. Um, whether they're good or bad, leave comments. <laughs> and uh, no, only if they're good, I guess, would be a better deal. But tell people. How you felt about that information that you got, whether it was helpful, uh, and uh, and share it with family members. I, I hope uh, you will find ways to tell others about the work that we're doing. So, gentlemen, thank you very much, and uh, we'll hopefully do this again soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks.